back. We're back. Hello everybody. Welcome to the Ant Show. And of course, this is why it, you know, things like this happen because it's live, of course. Hello. If technical difficulties didn't happen, then yeah, live, it wouldn't be live. So um, we'd like to welcome everybody to the show. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. Um, really means a lot to us. We've got a lot of great things coming up on the show. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, we've got uh, people logging in again. That's fine. Um, so yeah, while people are logging back in, just wanted to uh, let everybody know if ever it disconnects, um, just stay on the line. We'll uh, be up again shortly. I guess that's kind of the, the thing about live streaming is, you know, the whole technical difficulties element. But that's fine. We can deal with that. If ants can adapt after millions of years, we can adapt to live streaming. So, uh, so yeah, ev make sure to let everybody know to refresh. So here we go. Uh, what to expect on today's show? It's going to be great. Uh, we're featuring the formicidae of the day. We're going to take a closer look at tetramorium ants and their care, um, as well as watch a live feeding towards the end of the show. Tetramorium ants, of course, are more commonly known as pavement ants, and you see them often swarming in the summer in huge amounts on the sidewalks. Um, also on the show, uh, renowned biologist and myrmecologist Dr. James Traeger, widely known as Dr. Ant, will be making an appearance as we were able to interview him this week. Um, and he's going to talk to us about the findings on polyergus ants, also known as slave-making ants. For those of you that don't know, the ants are uh, such a diverse group of animals and uh, there are species that specialize in enslaving other species. Can you imagine if there was a gorilla species that kind of like raided human homes and used the humans as their slaves? Yeah, well that's something ants have to deal with. Uh, very interesting show up ahead, so be sure to stay tuned until the end. Um, but before we go on, uh, for those of you that are subscribed to our YouTube channel, you we recently put up a uh, video. Uh, which is entitled, What is going on here? What is happening here? We asked you, what could possibly be going on here? And this is the video right here. So, you have uh, Alasius Neonidra Queen kind of like stroking her gaster. Um, and we've got workers droning around her here. You can see her. She's uh, standing over a nice pile of brood there. We filmed this last week. And uh, a lot of you guys um, put in your guesses as to what she could possibly be doing here. But this is not what's peculiar. What's peculiar is, pe peculiar is coming up right now. So she kind of drums on her gaster a bit. The workers around her seem agitated. And then she arches her gaster underneath her and the workers swarm in around her and do the exact same thing. If you look closely, there's even a worker that was like above her and it fell and then it also f started flexing its gaster. We had no idea what was going on here when we were filming it. Such a strange phenomenon that we had to ask a pro. And so uh, this is something we ask uh, Dr. James Traeger today um, in the interview. And he gives us some insight as to what he feels is going on here. So. Uh, Stay tuned for that towards uh, the later half of the show. He's going to let us know. Um, for those of you that don't know, we do have a YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com slash antscanada. And uh, it looks like this. Um, be sure to subscribe. We've got videos coming out on a frequent basis. Um, anything ant related. And uh, including this uh, mystery video as to what the queen could be doing. Let's watch that once again here. A closer look there. As I was filming this, I was in awe. And in fact, this was supposed to be part of a previous video that we uploaded to YouTube on the Laceous Neonidra colony, but it was such a strange scene that I wanted to single it out and, uh, you know, have a pro kind of answer that. And also leave it up to you guys to, um, you know, 
relate what you guys feel is going on. So there she is. The workers are around her. She's rubbing her gaster. And there she goes. And there go her workers doing the exact same thing. And it's almost like the workers come rushing in from around the area, you know, as if something happened, you know, as if they knew something happened. It's kind of kind of strange. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to all those who are logged in into the chat. What's up, guys? How are you? You guys on the chat, where are you guys all coming from? I notice Mr. I Love the Ants there. Robomantis, Abs Ants, very familiar names. Welcome, welcome everybody. So, uh, yeah, we will be figuring out what uh, all of that, that thing was. Okay, so, moving on, we have lots to cover. Uh, the feature ant, the Formicidae of the day, Tetramorium species E, or Tetramorium caespidum. What is the difference? Well, uh, you know, in, if you are logged on to our, uh, wow, New Zealand, sweet, UK, nice, welcome. Um, if you were logged into our YouTube channel, um, formerly I was calling my colony uh, Tetramorium caespidum, but uh, turns out t uh, the ant known as Tetramorium caespidum, formerly here in North America, um, they've discovered that it's a different species. It's so now they call it Tetramorium species E. So I had to go back to all of our videos and change the title to just Tetramorium. Um, and uh, of course, Tetramorium caespidum or species E is uh, an invasive species, but we still love them because whatever, they're still ants. It's not their fault. It's not their fault that they've been so adaptive. <laughs> you know, is it humans' fault that we were so intelligent and like? totally took over all parts of the world. Anyways, that's uh, some ethics there. Um, okay, so the feature ant. Um, for those of you who are members, VIP members of Ants Canada, um, you guys already know some of this because in our latest video we uh, covered uh, the Tetramorium uh, genus and on their care and all of that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Ants Canada Ant Store has a membership program where uh, you essentially are given perks, so uh, which include private access to quarterly ant videos that only members can see. Um, of course, one of these magnetic membership cards. You get two of them, one for your home, one for work possibly, or for a friend or whatever. 10% uh, discount on all products, free queen and colony collecting techniques workbook right there, uh, which has helped a lot of people in collecting ants. It's, uh, it's actually... 200 pages and then another 200 pages of like of exercises and and journal uh, stuff and a lot of that goodness um, you as well get VIP priority packaging at all uh, at the warehouse special offers not available to non-members as well um, and you also get notification of products before they launch on our e-shelves and they get first dibs as well on uh, limited stock um, and uh, of course one uh, the purchasing of a membership lasts one year, um, and I believe it's uh, I believe it's twenty dollars, twenty dollars Canadian, so definitely worth it. Um, so now moving on, let's have a look at uh, Tetramorium. This is uh, of course the Tetramorium colony, um, and uh, this particular video features the Tetramorium colony of ours. Uh, right now, the alate uh, larvae are starting to appear. It's interesting, this colony is about two years old now. Oh no, we've disconnected. Okay, we're back online. So this colony has... Um, this colony here has is about two years old, um, and after the second year, uh, the alate larvae are starting to appear now. I haven't seen the queen in nearly seven months in this colony because the colony is so large. Uh, Tetramorium ants belong to the subfamily Myrmicinae, um, and Myrmicine ants are characterized by two waist segments and a stinger. Now, if all of that is jargon to you, um, 
don't uh, don't worry. The petiole, which is the waist segment, is unique to ants as well as other insects belonging to their suborder, which include wasps and bees. Um, and this waist segment is called the petiole. Uh, and basically, um, the waist segment is part of the abdomen. It's part of the first two segments of the abdomen. Um, and it's fused to the thorax. And that's why it's common practice to refer to their abdomen as a gaster, as opposed to abdomen, because the waist segment is technically part of the abdomen, but it isn't it's kind of like a separate, I guess, anatomical part, I suppose. Um, and myrmicine ants have two parts to that, uh, to that petiole. They have, they have an extra segment, I should say. Um, Tetramorium ants are generally very easy to keep. They make good uh, beginner species. Um, the queens are uh, monogynous, or monogynous, however you want to pronounce that. Um, and they're fully claustral. And what does that mean? Monogynous means that uh, there's only one queen in a colony. Um, and fully claustral means that uh, they seal themselves off completely. You don't need to feed them at all uh, during this founding process when she, the queen rears the young on her own. Um, and the first set of workers basically pioneer the growth of the colony. Uh, the nuptial flights for this species uh, in North America take place uh, from May to July, and the flights usually occur from 4 to 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, but, you know, you can generally find the DLHs, the mated queens, throughout the day um, in those months. And uh, it's really interesting because uh, I we've created a video on uh, when I accidentally stumbled upon a flight happening at, I believe it was 5 in the morning. It was... Uh, it's really interesting, and it's and it's actually fairly cold, you know, here at that time, um, in May in the morning, and uh, the ants still seem to uh, want to engage in their nuptial flight, which is really neat. Uh, their habitat, uh, f they're found nesting in nearly all habitats in America to Japan, North Africa to North Europe, including British Isles. Um, they're notorious for nesting among the urban setting, particularly around sidewalks and roads and rocks and pavement, which is why they are called um, pavement ants. Um, their ideal nest moisture level is uh, around 20 to 40 percent moisture. Um, you know, they don't really like it too, too wet, um, and they will tolerate some semi-dry nests, but uh, just as like a rough estimate, 20 to 40 percent moist nest is... Uh, is, is where they are best. Um, in this video you see them here in an Ants Canada pumice nest which uh, has really really helped the colony a lot. Um, the ideal nest temperature is 20 to 27 degrees Celsius but again they're very tolerant of a wide um, array of conditions um, but that seems to be, you know, room temperature is really good for them I guess. Their outwell temperature 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. When they're kept about you know, a degree or two warmer um, than uh, than room temperature. They 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 pretty much thrive. You know, um, the ideal Ants Canada nest for them um, are the of course the pumice stone ant nests, um, but also the habitat nests. Um, sometimes in the habitat nests, they tend to really get into the first layer of the uh, the lining of the wall and they'll, they really do customize the area so sometimes they'll put sand along the glass um, but they're still viewable. Uh, Tetramorium ants really are just so interesting to watch and uh, for those of you who uh, watch, who are tuned into our YouTube channel, here's uh, the um, feeding on a cantaloupe uh, there so and uh, they're just so dynamic you know it uh, here it's time lapsed, so they're moving fast, but right now they're moving generally slow because it's still hibernation period, of course. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just all around very easy and interesting species to keep uh, for ant keepers of all levels, you know. And uh, their colonies grow very quickly. And it's, uh, you see them there? They're loving this cantaloupe. They accept a wide array of foods, and you'll see later, we're going to try feeding these ants uh, some chopped up mealworms and uh, possibly some uh, clementine, a piece of clementine there. 
um, and they're gonna we'll, we'll see how that how that works out um, now all of this information was taken from the ant database in our FAQ section at antscanada.com which by the way if you notice a species you may have had success with in the past and it's not in our ant database feel free to write to us and let us know uh, you know we want to add to the ant database um, this is for everybody's benefit and for the ants that you're keeping. Uh, be sure to also check out our helpful ant dictionary, which contains all the terms and names you may have heard here. Um, and uh, that's a, that again is found in the FAQ section of our website. So, uh, got the Tetramorium ants there. Very neat species. Love them. They're so cool. Yeah, it is weird how they're not uh, climbing on the fruit. I mean, they're. I mean, this fruit also came from the fridge too. That might be, that might be uh, a reason why. Usually, when there's wet food placed in the outworld, um, they 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 start burying it. But they here it doesn't seem like they're burying it right away. It's kind of kind of interesting. All right, so we'll see more of the Tetramorium colony in a moment. So um, now. We uh, basically are going to talk about um, new stuff that's coming out. So our recent product, of course, was the Rainforest series of Outworlds that have come out. If you haven't seen it, be sure to check out the video on our YouTube account. Um, you know, the video where I'm doing snow angels in a tank top and shorts. My favorite pastime in the winter, of course. Um, and that's the... Habitat Outworld, we've got the Rainforest Macro Habitat Outworld here, very nice. Um, and so, we have a new product coming out, and it's very heavy here, just let me... Oh, let's get a drum roll, let's get a drum roll, let's see here. Can't I have a drum roll? This is it. What is this, you ask? If you're a VIP membership, a member, you would know what this is. This here is uh, the Ants Canada Hydro Stopper. Let me explain how it works. Whoops. I'm sure we all know um, what it's like to have moldy test tubes. No, it's not drugs. <laughs> it's... <laughs> We all know what it's like to have moldy test tubes, um, and you know they're a hassle. You gotta move the ants into um, the into a new test tube, you know, because it can endanger the colony. This and that. Um, but we found a replacement for cotton that is more mold resistant. See, the problem with cotton is it comes from a cotton plant, which is a shrub that's native to the tropics and subtropical regions which means it's organic which means it molds and a colony will produce waste they'll defecate often on the cotton or away from the cotton but still it, uh, it you know it's a perfect environment for mold to happen and we all know what moldy test tubes look like this is a test tube that um, a colony was living in for six months and we have mold in there um, but this stuff, which looks like feta cheese, is pretty much like cotton, but it's more mold resistant. Now look, well, I brought out a colony from, two colonies from, uh, from hibernation, just to show you. Let's see if we can get in here. This is, these two colonies are six month old colonies that have been living in these test tubes for six months. Here, I'm going to have to manually... They've been living in these test tubes. See that? Now, the mold inside the test, the test tube is localized, and it's it's growing on. On on their feces, but the actual hydro stopper itself does not mold. It's mold resistant. See that? Oh, sorry. Excuse my nails. I've been, I've been uh, playing with the tetramorium out there. See that? And the, actually, I should, I should watch out with this colony because the uh, it's starting to overflow, which happens when you remove them from hibernation. Water expands and then starts to flood. Don't worry, I'll save you. There we go. They're saved. 
Okay, let's uh, go back. And let's take a look again at the moldy test tube. This is six months after use. See that? Big difference. And the mold actually... Uh, the mold actually spreads. In this one here, you see the mold even in the water. It's pretty gross. No, you don't want your ants in that. So uh, that's a product coming out, of course, at the store. Uh, shortly. Um, so also, we'd like to go into uh, suggested literature. Now, we have three here. The first of which is... Uh, Adventures Among Ants, um, we've been plugging this book for a while now, um, and it really is really is a great read um, by Mark Moffat, of course, who we also interviewed on the channel. Uh, very informative. He goes into uh, various kinds of ants um, that he's uh, studied in his adventures, and they really are adventures, because he talks not only about ants, but he talks about you know, all the places he visits and the people he comes, you know, in, in contact with. And <laughs> I was actually laughing in many parts because, you know, Mark Moffat is a very eccentric individual and it really comes across in his literature as well. And, you know, sometimes I was wondering, I'm like, I wonder if the people he talks about are able to read this book. <laughs> so um, my favorite part of the book is um, his, uh, his delving into the concept of superorganism. Now, um, at first I was like, yeah, okay, a colony is a superorganism, yeah, yeah. This, it's, I felt like, in my mind, it was more of a symbolic thing. But he actually um, talks about other animals that are kind of like, I wouldn't say on the verge of being superorganisms. Like, for example, he talks about slime molds, which um, are basically these blobs or whatever. And they, um, individually, they, they live separate lives, you know, but in unfavorable conditions, when things get dry or whatever, or when food runs low, they kind of come together and form this one massive blob, which can travel, you know, to like new locations and travel through spaces in the soil, which typically couldn't happen if they were just individual blobs. So they kind of almost form a super organism that way, you know, and, um, it's really interesting and it really kind of gave me a new perspective and he kind of goes into you know how for example the raids of the um, marauder ant Fidologetan, um, that he studies that's the first chapter um, he talks about how you know they they for they do raids and he mentions okay I don't want to spoil the book but you know it after reading the book I kind of had a new I guess perspective on what a super organism really is you know um, and that ants truly are, I guess, kind of a, a super organism. Like a colony is kind of like one big organism. And you can, uh, that's one of the th insights. There's just tons of stuff in here. Um, it took me a while to read because I'm reading, usually reading several books at a time. But you can see it's kind of gone through the wear and tear of my travels. Um, so that's one uh, great literature uh, that uh, you definitely should look at. Um, the second one is this. It's a... Uh, the Journal of Insect Science, Volume 10, Article 111, and uh, it's, uh, it's basically a paper um, entitled A Descriptive Morphology of the Ant Genus Procryptoceros. I know it sounds scary, but basically it's a, a, an in-depth scientific, I guess, research um, paper on anatomy. Now, if you were tuned into uh, our... YouTube channel, you saw our Ant Anatomy 101 video where we sang about all the body parts. Well, uh, all most of those terms are the latest, I guess, terminology for these anatomical parts of the ant. Um, and this one, this paper basically delves into those anatomical, anatomical parts of the ant belonging to the genus Procryptoceros. Um, so that's here. You can download that. Uh, here, let me get you the link. Um, copy. I'm going to post it in the chat. Right there. You guys can uh, download that. It's a PDF. Uh, for those of you that are watching, not from uh, live streaming, you can uh, basically find our video entitled Ant Anatomy 
Lesson 101 on YouTube, and it's in the info section. That's where the link is. Um, and it's written by Serna and McKay. Okay, two people there. Um, and it's got great, uh, I mean, it's very, it's very, um, I guess, scientifically intensive. Like, it, I was reading through it going, what is this jargon? I don't get it. But, uh, you know, you, you might be able to get, gather a lot of the stuff, you know. Um, and it's good to, you know, to learn. Challenge yourself a little bit. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, it's got great, uh, let's see here, it's got great diagrams, which uh, breaks down all the parts. It took me a good uh, three hours to read it, actually. Um, I'm looking for a diagram right now. Okay, here, you see? Here's when it looks into the diagram of, this is, a, is this a worker? This is a worker right here. You see all that? See all that goodness? So, uh, yeah, great read. Um, it was actually suggested to me uh, by uh, Dr. James Traeger, who we'll be interviewing shortly in the show. And uh, it's a wonderful read. <clears throat> so be sure to look, get that. Very, very important. Um, all right, the third piece of literature is this. Um, it's the Ants Canada Queen and Colony Collecting Techniques. It's a book we worked on um, to help, I mean, mostly beginner, but also medium to advanced. Uh, there's some stuff in there to help you. also gives down a breakdown of some of our products, like our, um, let me grab it, our uh, aspirator. You see this? And the aspirator actually has multiple purposes. Today I used it to uh, clean the outworld of our Tetramorium colony. See, this attaches onto there, and then you have a plug. Where did the plug go? That plugs onto here, so you can take your colony home safe. And essentially, you lay this you lay this down this way, and you attach a tube to here, and you uh, either shine a light or whatever you want, or you can even leave it this way. Um, and open the top, smother the inside with Vaseline, whatever. You kind of have to adapt. Ant keeping requires a lot of adapting because ants kind of have a mind of their own. You know, you can't really predict what they do. You just kind of have to learn to think like an ant colony. Not like an ant, an ant colony. Uh, so yeah, this is a great book. It's, uh, it's 400 pages. A lot of it is exercises. Um, you know, it helps. There's even a, the first exercise is kind of like a question and answer type thing to help you evaluate whether it's best for you to raise a colony from just a single queen during nuptial flight or whether you know it's more of your thing to go out in the field and collect a colony and there are tips on collecting whole colonies with the queen on here all our secrets are on here um, and uh, very helpful helpful piece of literature and it uh, it's ten dollars Canadian of course, and you know you can share it with all your friends and all that. Uh, we have the option on our site to uh, download it uh, as a PDF, so we email it to you within 24 hours, or we can just send you the physical CD. So that's that. All right, now um, we've been waiting for the big interview with uh, Dr. James Traeger, also known as uh, Dr. Ant um, online, who's definitely been um, a huge, huge uh, individual in the myrmecological community, the biological community, as well as the ant keeping community. Um, I've seen him uh, pretty much everywhere helping out, and uh, you know, he's very incisive. Um, and uh, so we were able to interview him uh, this week. So here is the interview. Enjoy. Hey, what's up guys? It's Ans Canada here, once again, bringing you another interview with the greats. As you know, we at Ans Canada like to interview renowned people from all over the world. And uh, today we have a very, very special guest. He's very well known. 
online and in the myrmecological biological world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. James Traeger, who is joining us today on Phone Patch. James, are you there? I'm here. It's good to be with you. Awesome. Well, it's really, truly a pleasure to have you here. We know a lot of people on our channel uh, are big fans of your work, and uh, you've definitely helped a lot of people, um, you know, on the online community as well with sharing your knowledge. Um, so before we get into this, James, uh, the clip you saw earlier with the Laceus, what's, what's your take on what's happening there? Well, I believe the queen actually is laying an egg there. Um, at one point, right around the one minute mark in the video, you can see a worker quickly come out from underneath the queen with an egg in its mandibles, and I think it's carrying away a fresh laid one. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and as far as the... Uh, the other workers, uh, uh, rather, yeah, the workers that are gathered around the queen with their gaster flexing um, activity, that's, well, workers that are in the queen's retinue, those which hang close to her, are often very attentive to her movements, and uh, you can see them sort of getting agitated when she's starting to uh, tap at the hind portion of her gaster with her hind legs. Right. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, a technical term for it, but it's sort of a sympathetic activity. You know, they're wow. they're just they're watching it happen, and is a, I guess that's a reflection of their uh, emotional, physiological state, or whatever you want to call it. Wow, that's incredible! So you you're suggesting then that the workers have like an emotional bond to their queen, in that sense, I guess. Well. That might be a stretch to put it into those sort of human terms, but clearly they, they're they highly social organisms, very attuned to each other's uh, state of being and activity and so on. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, that answers a lot of questions. <laughs> At what point in your life, James, did you decide it was your vocation to study ants? Well, I've been interested in ants as long as I can remember. Uh, which is back to about age five. And uh, I guess unlike many people who grow up and go on and do something practical, I just kept on with the ants. <laughs> You're saying that uh, studying ants is not so practical? <laughs> well, uh, it, it actually does have a, a very practical side in the sense that uh, a number of ant species, uh, as we know, are economically important. Right. Uh, before the... Uh, leaf cutting ants are the are the most important crop pests in tropical America. Uh, carpenter ants with their damage to wood structures and so on. Excellent. Now um, I'm curious uh, for the aspiring um, myrmecologists out there. How long does it typically take to um, I guess be considered a myrmecologist? Like, does it require a doctorate degree? Well, there have been some very competent myrmecologists who did not have doctoral degrees, and I can think of at least one who uh, didn't even complete a uh, four-year college degree. But normally, yeah, it requires uh, an advanced degree in entomology, and um, in my own case, I went to school for 24 years. Wow. From kindergarten through the end, uh, receiving my PhD, so wow. yeah, that's a, a half a lifetime, <laughs> and well, and uh, no, it does generally require a lot of study um, to, in order to end up working in the field. I see. Uh, my particular work, my day job, if you will, uh, deals more with uh, ecology and botany than with ants, uh, I... per se, although they're not absolutely excluded from my daily work. Right. But uh, my, I don't have an entomologist job. I'm a, I'm a uh, biologist. Uh, slash naturalist at a nature reserve. I see. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, those who study ants, they kind of don't limit their title to just myrmecologist. It's, uh, they tend to, you know, ha ha be broader in terms of their categor categorization. Yeah, and I think many of them have broader interests than just ants, too. Ants interact with so, much, so many other things in, in the natural world that uh, you almost ha cannot help be uh, interested in some of those other uh, organisms as well. Great. Um, now, where is your favorite place in the world to study ants, James? <laughs> wow, that's a tough question because it's <laughs> it's interesting. Just about 
about anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in North America, I, I've, I've spent most of my time here, but uh, I also have uh, spent a fair amount of time studying ants in tropical America mm -hmm. in various South America, South American and Central American countries. But really, um, I, I suppose if I had to pick a favorite, uh, it would be in the American Southwest, um, where the, you have such a diversity of ants uh, ranging from those species of the hot deserts all the way up to the ones of the high mountains. Well, incredible. The state of Arizona, for example, has uh, close to 250 species of ants living there, and you can certainly uh, wow. never, uh, one lifetime is not enough to, to learn about all of them. That's incredible. Detail, that, anyway. yeah. That's amazing. And that's, did you say 250 discovered ones, or, or are we still discovering more there? Uh, well, yeah, we do. As a matter of fact, uh, we run the ant course, which is an ant training workshop for uh, professional biologists, usually graduates down in southeastern Arizona, and, uh, and I'm an instructor in that program, and they... Uh, it's not unusual for us to find an ant uh, during those sessions. They last about 10 days, and we've got 30 people scouring the hills of southeastern Arizona for an wow. ant. It's not unusual for us to turn up a new species in a session of the ant course, in spite of the fact that that's one of the more better collected regions of the world in terms of the ant lore. I see. Now, do you... Uh, realize right there that you might have discovered something new like how do you how do you determine that I guess you have to bring them into the lab to uh, to analyze under microscope is that how it works uh, that's usually how how it works uh, sometimes you'll find something that's so distinctive that you know right away that it's, uh, that it's not one you've seen before or that is known from that area Excellent. Well, now, um, we do know that you've done a lot of research on um, polyorgus ants, and I believe you're working on a publication on the genus polyorgus. Is that is that true? Could you tell us more about uh, that? Yeah, I was right, doing a bit of writing on that this morning, as a matter of fact. When can we expect it to be released? Well, I've been um, working on this particular project off and on since I was in graduate school about 25 years ago, and... Uh, in the interest in them goes back farther than that uh, into childhood because I was fortunate to live in places where they were abundant. I should say here uh, what polyergus is. It's a, it's a genus of ants that uh, is popularly known as the slave-making ants or Amazon ants. Mm -hmm. No relation to the Amazon basin of Brazil, but the, the, uh, the name comes from the mythological female warriors uh, of the Amazons, and uh, because these are sort of a warlike uh, group of ants, or so it has been said. And he uh, performed these spectacular raids uh, in late, hot summer afternoons uh, where they steal the cocoons and the mature larvae of a related species of ant in another genus, the genus Formica. Mm -hmm. They carry them home, and... Uh, the home nest actually uh, contains a mixed population of the polyergus, which are typically red in color, and the uh, formicas uh, species, which can be anywhere from uh, yellow to uh, oh. a black species, depending on the particular situation and location in the world. But anyway, the uh, polyergus uh, raids are kind of famous, probably gave rise to this, you know, the storied battle of the black and red ants that people, everybody sort of seems to have as part of their subconscious knowledge of yeah. that ant. Interesting. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. I've, I myself have never seen a polyergus ant. Um, what's their distribution? How far north do they go and south? And Are well, they, they found are in other parts area. of the world? Um, I have seen some specimens from uh, southern Ontario. Wow. I'm not sure how much farther north than that they go. Uh, but I know they're widely distributed. Well, they're in all the 48 U.S. states, uh, probably in all the adjoining Canadian territories. And they extend pretty well south in the mountains of Mexico at higher altitudes where the formica that they can parasitize also occur. 
there's also uh, three species in uh, over in Europe and Asia. Oh, okay, so they're overseas as well. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, is there a specific uh, host species that every polyergus species parasitizes, or are they just generalized? Uh, general. Yeah, that's that's the interesting question. Um, there's always in the literature, it's generally you get the uh, impression that the polyergus use just whatever's around, um, and. Um, but part of that comes from the fact that we haven't recognized how many species of polyergus there really are. And um, right now, uh, on a worldwide basis, there's about six of them that are uh, recognized. Wow. I have names, but uh, when I get done with them, it's going to be about three times that many. Incredible. It's based on uh, a, a set of careful measurements that I've been taking, and... Uh, uh, associations with specific hosts for mica species. I and, see. Uh, so not not everyone has just one host species. Some of them have only one. Others have a uh, some some several to choose from uh, that are close relatives of one another. Okay, great. So let's talk about the colony founding process of a polyergus queen. So a polyergus queen has its nuptial flight, it mates, and then it drops to the ground. How does it start its colony then? Well, there seem to be uh, two different patterns. Uh, and in one, um, the mated queens will accompany a raid. Mm -hmm. They'll follow a, ra uh, a boot robbing raid. And I then see. enter the colony that's sort of in dis disarray after the polyergus workers run off with their cocoons. Wow. And that seems to give them some sort of an advantage in, in establishing a, a colony in there. So you're the saying... Uh, the other pattern is where the queens uh, run around independently uh, seeking a colony of the host species and enter it. Now, so that's... Uh, and we know that when a, when a queen polyergus enters a, a Formica colony... Um, the first thing she tries to do is to find the queen of that colony. And uh, the, practically the instant that she finds this host species queen, she grabs onto her, pierces her body with her strong uh, dagger-shaped mandibles, wow. and lathers her with uh, formic acid and Dufour's gland secretions, and ends up, uh, and then holds on to the dying or dead queen's body for quite a while, uh, 15 minutes or more, and sort of rubbing around on it and trying, apparently what they're doing is picking up the odor of the host queen. Right. And when they finally let go, the workers, uh, those four mica workers, uh, think that she smells like their, their own queen. Incredible. Wow, that's, that's such a different way <laughs> of colony founding. That's uh, so interesting. It is. There, well, there's a, a, a third thing that I can say about this, um, and that is polyergus tend to fly a few weeks after the host Formica species fly. And I think uh, a lot of them are actually invading very young colonies of Formica that e either only have their very first few workers. I see. Or, or maybe not even any mature workers yet. And we know that when a polyergus queen is put together with a formica queen that has brood but no workers yet, she doesn't kill the formica queen, but goes in and makes friends with her, so to speak, oh. and allows her to continue living until there are enough workers in the nest to support her own brood, that is her being the polyergus queen. Interesting. That's it's fascinating. Yeah, that is fascinating. Behavior. So if they get into a... Uh, Sure, from like the colony, they kill the queen, soak up her, her odor, and try to get accepted with that ready made worker force. If the worker force isn't there yet, they wait it out until one becomes available, and then they do the, the uh, subterfuge. <laughs> wow, how intriguing. Now, um, yeah, I'm yeah. wondering uh, is Polyergus the only genus known to, I guess, slave raid in this way? No, no uh, not at all. Um, there are uh, a number of species 
actually in the genus Formica that do this. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's another genus called Rossomermex in uh, Europe and Asia that uh, uses slaves, if you will, of a related a genus related to Formica called uh, Proformica. And then there are a number of ants in another subfamily, the, the uh, Myrmicine group. Yep. That. Uh, go out and steal brood and live in mixed colonies with, with um, so-called slaves as well. That's great. It's so I I kind of wonder how, like through evolution, a species could engage themselves in such a symbiosis. It's so it's so strange. Um, would you say that Polyergus is your favorite kind of ant, James? At least the study. Well, I uh, at the moment yes, uh, because I'm so involved with them. But I have to say that when I've done research on other ants and just sort of gotten my head totally into that particular group, they have sort of temporarily become my favorites. Um, but really, I'm I'm quite fascinated by a wide array of ants, and I think I, I could study just about any of them and, and, and get intensely interested as I am at the moment in polyergus. Now, do you own any pet ants, James? I do not have any pet ant colonies at the moment, but you can be sure that since my callow youth, I have had many ant colonies over the years, and uh, some of them I've kept for several years, uh, and they remained in good health, and I ended up either releasing, usually releasing them or keeping them until the queen died. I see. Uh, What species? I'm curious. (laughs) um, Well, uh, I've got... uh, as you might expect, I've kept a lot of Formica. Uh, I don't... Polyergus, they are so hardwired to do this raiding thing where they have to leave the nest and everything. There's captivity is not really a good situation for them. Right, yeah. Um, I've kept the twig, uh, twig nesting um, Pseudobermex ants, the funny little wasp-like slender ants that uh, live in the tropics. And there are several species in Florida, so that's where I uh, kept them. Great. Now, uh, I kept a variety anyway. They're all kind of interesting. Some are very difficult, though. You know, I, I think uh, people don't uh, readily appreciate some, some ant species are really kind of fussy, and uh, they need things just the way they need them, and you can't really replicate it in captivity. In captivity. Yeah, totally understand that. Speaking of which, uh, do you have any words of advice or wisdom that uh, you'd like to give to young people out there who love ants and might be keeping ants and are watching this interview, James? Words? Oh, I should have prepared myself better for this question. <laughs> um, the, the main thing that I can say is uh, uh, not to be deterred by um, other people's disinterest. Um, mm-hmm. Ants are uh, really fascinating creatures, uh, but that, as you know, is probably not fully appreciated by everyone in the world. And uh, so, you know, you just have you have to be a little bit thick-skinned in pursuing your study of ants because uh, uh, people tend to think it's silly or not important or something. But as we've seen, it can have a real practical application. And if nothing else, it's a tremendous way to appreciate uh, a tiny little bit of, of natural beauty that we are so blessed to live with on this, in this world. You know? I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you so much, James, for joining us. That was a fun and great interview. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing it when, it when it's posted, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a good time. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the year. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was uh, Dr. James Traeger. Uh, reporting live from the United States <laughs> and uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel thank you so much for the support guys stay tuned for the next interview bye bye here we go Everybody, we're back. 
And there you go, you have the interview with Dr. Ant. Um, apparently it's uh, trying to reconnect to the server again here. Um, but uh, otherwise, it was a really fun interview. Um, and you know, it shed a lot of light. Um, turns out that clip in the beginning uh, with the Laceous Neoniger Queen uh, phenomenon, she, I guess she was laying an egg. Um, you know, they're supposed to be hibernating, but uh, I don't know. I guess uh, they're coming out of hibernation quickly. Um, and as for the workers, they're, uh, I guess they, they, he says they were, I guess, acting, in, you know, in connection with the queen. I guess he, he used sympathetic, he used that word, which to me kind of was interesting because it, uh, it almost, it almost uh, makes me think, is this kind of proof of, um, is this proof of a collective consciousness? You know, lately I've been reading a lot of uh, literature on um, quantum biology. Um, and, you know, it, I, I, I sometimes wonder if it's a collective consciousness in the colony. Because it seems like 